greatest victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, what raiment shall be given? Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the host of night. In Jesus' conquering name, faith is a victory, faith is a victory, all oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. And good morning. Am I on sound? I'm good. All right. Uh, let's see. Several things. <clears throat> At Parbar westward forth the cause like to it Parbar. What's that got to do with Hebrews chapter whatever? <laughs> Five. Has to do with spiritual maturity. That's Old Testament when they set up the guards for the temple. And uh, you don't have all that expensive gold laying out without some kind of security. So that is what they were doing there. We today are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And according to chapter 5, there are five senses that have to be exercised. What are our guards? What do you listen to? Do you allow yourself to taste and touch and so on? Are these guards in your life to say, I just don't do that. I don't listen to that. I don't do that. That's the spiritual maturity because you uh, can uh, have a lot of head knowledge, but if it doesn't make any difference in your life, it's not going to have much effect. If you're sitting there drinking with your buddies and talking about Christ can really change the world, they're having problems over here. Uh, I can hear myself, though. Uh, but if uh, you're sitting there drinking with your buddies and say Christ really changes you, he's going to look at you like, uh-huh. Or if you're smoking or some of those other things and say Christ can make a difference, they need to see it. And spiritual maturity says, I'm going to grow in the Lord and there's some things I'm not going to do. I like the verse. That's why I stick it there. I used it earlier in this lesson. And then I found something I want to read to you. You think of today's world being, we've never seen some of this before. Listen to this. Would you be surprised to find out that your teenage son or daughter favored government control of the nation's nine basic industries? A well-known research firm was just as surprised recently when they asked thousands of high school teenagers across the country, in your opinion, should industry be run by the government? Or privately operated. More than half of the teenagers thought that the nation's industry should be owned, operated by the government. Of the young people questioned, 84% considered patriotism unnecessary, and 40% could name no advantage of capitalism over communism. Wow. I'm looking through my old stuff. That's 1966. You think we got something new and different going on? They had it back then. So sometimes when you want to be overwhelmed with the news, don't be. Don't be. Just keep focusing on the Lord. He's the only solution we have at all. So let's keep on going now. Uh, by the way, you do know we're in chapter 6, but we've already kind of done parts of 7, 8, and 9 because we jumped ahead on Melchizedek and the Old and New Covenants, all right? So we will skip when we get to there. Whoops. We were into baptizo, and I'm going to go back and kind of review from the last week a little bit. We are Baptists, and everybody, when you walk out of this room, you should be able to defend why we are Baptists with our baptism. In fact, one of the things I did not point out is you've probably all heard of the fundamentals of the faith. Actually, what happened was the Methodists began to have some very liberal teachers in their colleges that then bled into their 
churches, and so did the Presbyterians, and so did some of the others. In 1920 or so, they coined a new word called fundamentalism, and with that, you had a group of people, Bob Jones was one of them, who then became fundamentalists. Okay, they were still Methodists, they were still Presbyterian, and guess what? Baptism is not considered a fundamental of the faith. Baptists never got into that kind of a problem because we were too poor to send our students off to Europe to be ingrained by this new liberalism that was coming down in 1920. But now here we are, 2020, and we are beginning to see that kind of a thing inside of our Baptist churches. But even so, what is it that we believe as Baptists? First of all, baptism, the word baptism is not an English word. I suspect that if they had translated it to what it means, the Anglican church would have serious problems in their church because people would come to the bishop and say, to plunge, to dip, to immerse, to place into, what's this sprinkling water thing then? See, the way they did it, by transliterating it, just bringing it straight in, then they could probably just answer, well, that's what we do when we baptize and just kind of pawn it off. So I personally try to make a difference when people want to say, and I was like eight days old, I saw the certificate, baptized in a Methodist church. No, I just got wet. I was not baptized. Baptism is to plunge, to dip, to immerse, to place into it. If you're not baptized by immersion, well, then you're not baptized. Number two, there is a split in the, uh, well, not Rome, well, yeah, Roman Catholic Church. They, one group sprinkles. The other group actually immerses an eight-day-old baby. Maybe you've never heard of such a thing, but they have done that. I've seen pictures of that. So, uh, maybe, you know, you just keep it in mind, but that's what it means. All right, baptism, and I mentioned that there are four kinds. We got through kind of two of them. I'm going to backtrack again a little bit of a review. There's John the Baptist baptism, there's a Christian baptism, there's a Holy Spirit, and then there's one by fire. All right? Before I get to some of that, can baptism save? Because that's an issue. In fact, it's called baptismal regeneration is the theological termination of it, that without baptism, you can't be saved. I'm walking again. I've got to remember to just kind of stay somewhere here. He tells me I get too far over. I disappear. All right. Um, baptismal regeneration. Encountered that a lot in St. Vincent. A lot. Uh, here you have what Church of Christ... Uh, Seventh-day kind of teach it that way. But if you do not get baptized, then you're not going to get to heaven. To which I say, to be consistent with that thought. If you're having a week of crusade meetings, as they have done, then when somebody responds that night, you ought to take them down and baptize them because you have no guarantee that they will be alive in the morning. Uh, if you really believe that, um, they don't. They don't do that. Can baptism wash away sin? The answer to that hopefully is no, it does not. By the way, they've got a Bible verse for that, but we'll and not go there. But is baptism necessary for salvation? Thief on the cross. Who died first? Jesus or the thief? I've read a booklet by Baptismal Regeneration saying the thief died before Christ, so he's still in the Old Testament. He didn't have to get baptized in order to be saved. The answer to that is read your Bible. Because <laughs> who died first? Jesus died first. And with that, the new covenant goes into effect. With that, a whole bunch of other things go into effect. And so, again... Uh, how did the thief get to heaven without baptism at all? Acts 15, if you would, please turn there. 
Like I said, we're going to kind of cover a little bit of what I did last week. I've had another thought that, I'm, that I've added that will come out this morning. Acts chapter 15. And certain men which came down from Judah taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Well, that makes baptism part of the salvation. If you're not baptized, you're not going to be saved. Well, they argued it. They argued it. Finally, they decided they'd send a delegation to Jerusalem and asked the apostles down there, what did they believe? So they got their group together. The uh, opposing side got their group together. They went down. The church at Jerusalem sat evidently in an open meeting, and they began to discuss that. And you can read that in chapter 15. But what happens, well, before I get there, put anything there. Circumcision. Okay, I mentioned last time that some people believe that baptism replaces circumcision, in which I said, well, okay, and then half plus of all baptisms we ever do is wasted because we didn't circumcise women. So it can't be a replacement. Eight days, just like circumcision. Well, okay, but... What do you do for a parent, a grieving parent who's lost a small child? How do you know that that child gets to heaven? You know, we got to baptize them. So they do at eight days. Um, for a small child, how do you know that a small child gets to heaven? What? Okay, now that's interesting. If you were to look up age of accountability, you won't find anything. Okay. Very good. The idea when David's son died, he stated, I, my son cannot come back to me, but I will go to my son. And that's a pretty definite statement to say, my son went to heaven and I'm going there too, because we know David did. And that's a very good answer. There's also another one. Uh, I forget where it's at in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, where it talks about all of the nations and all of the language groups around the throne of God singing praises to God. Do you know that there are countries that they've had language groups that are gone before the gospel ever got there? South America, the Incas, they're gone. They were gone a long time ago. How did they get to heaven? I believe because of children who died, who never got to that, we call it age of accountability. When do we have an age of accountability? Eight days? I don't think so. Eight years? Maybe. Uh, what do you do with mentally deficient children? There's issues that I can't answer. But uh, God in his mercy, he knows how to deal with that kind of a thing. Uh, okay. But in this passage, circumcision, they say it's necessary. Well, put anything there. Good deeds. If you do good deeds, you have to have it in order to be saved. I do good deeds because I'm saved, not in order to be saved. Church membership. I think it's important. I think you ought to be a member of a church. I think you allow yourself to be open for satanic attacks if you're outside of a church membership. In Corinthians chapter 5, there's this guy that's sleeping with his mother, and Paul says, put him out of the church so Satan can destroy the flesh. And you're going, wait a minute. Satan can't get at him while he's a member of the church, and evidently the answer is not really. So put him out. So in other words, if I'm a member of a church, maybe I can have some protection spiritually from Satan and his attacks. At least I advise you to be a member of a good church, okay? But you can put that there. Is that necessary for salvation? No, but I am saved, so therefore I will be a member of a good church. Acts 15, 10. The summarization of this discussion. 
Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Peter's summing it up. You, you want to put them under circumcision? That's Old Testament law. Our fathers couldn't keep the law. We can't keep the law. And every time I've been around a Seventh-day Adventist, they're keeping the law, and especially they're keeping the law for their salvation. I said, what are the Ten Commandments? And I think I've only encountered one or two who can actually give me all ten. Most of them maybe get about five. And I said, so you're trying to keep the law and you don't even know what it is. That doesn't even begin to make sense. So Peter is saying, if you're going to circumcise, you're going to go back under the law, you're going to go back and do all of these things. Our fathers didn't do it, and we can't do it either. So 1511, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they early fathers. And not one of those Old Testament saints got baptized. The first time we run into baptism in the Bible is New Testament with John the Baptist. It's just like there's 400 plus years between Malachi and Matthew. God is silent and suddenly here's John the Baptist and he's doing what? He's taking people out and placing them under the water. This is something strange. And by the way, he qualifies as a priest. Uh, his father was a priest there in the temple, so he could have been. Uh, this uh, surely uh, attracted some people to say, what's going on? But here it is, okay? Uh, but we should be saved, even as they were. They were saved without baptism. We're going to get saved without baptism. The Bible says in the Old Testament, the just shall live by faith. They looked forward to what Christ was going to do, and we look back. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Not one single baptism in the Old Testament. John's baptism did not save. Neither will any baptism save today. Now, I gave these last week. Matthew 3.11, Mark 1.4, Luke 3.3, 3, and... Uh, then we went to Acts 19, where John the Baptist's disciples meet with Paul and end up being rebaptized. And with that, I say, whatever John's baptism is, has been done away with, and so we don't have to really study that very far. I'm not trying to study baptism per se, but this is one of the fundamentals. I think we make sure we ought to know. But Acts 19... Uh, they, they rebaptized John the Baptist's disciples. So we could do away with, it says, baptism of repentance. Did not include, last week, Baptist brighters. I've already asked a couple of people this morning, what's a Baptist brighter? I mentioned last week being baptized three times face forward in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Never heard of that until I went to St. Vincent. And when we heard of it, I'm like, okay, now wait a minute. And we remembered a National Geographic of a baptismal picture that was in the National Geographic. The pastor that was doing it at the time, still alive, still preaching. And we looked up National Geographic, and the guy's very obviously coming back after being face forward in the water. He's dripping water down and stuff. And, yep, that man still teaches that. And he's still in St. Vincent. But Baptist Brighter, I did not mention. I encountered that in Florida. I encountered it again in Florida. I encountered it again and again and again. What does that mean? Not baptized unless you can prove the chain of people back to John the Baptist. In other words, the guy that baptized you had to be baptized by somebody who had to be baptized by somebody who had to be baptized by John the Baptist. That's a Baptist Brighter. Is that a legitimate belief? We just covered it, Acts 19. Whatever John the Baptist's baptism was, stopped, if you will, at Acts 19. They got baptized, never heard of the Holy Spirit. There's something different there, and so therefore they got rebaptized. 
also a very popular verse. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Uh, grammar. What did Jesus just say? And upon this rock I what? Will build. What is that? Future tense. Hadn't started it yet. If it was ongoing already, there is a, a Greek and an English verb you could use to say it's been started and it's continuing and I will be continually building on it. This one is a simple in the future, I will build my church. Okay? Uh, which means what? The church hadn't started yet. Duh. Well, now some people put the church in the Old Testament. Started, and there is a particular reference where it was translated church in the wilderness. Church means a called out group. If I took a list of names and I stood out in that doorway and I called some and you all, the ones I called came, that's my called out group. The Church of Jesus Christ is a called out group. A specific set of people who've been saved, called out of this world. All right? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Simple, future tense. So again, the idea, oh, when this was said, who had died? Occurred first. The death of John the Baptist or the start of the church? When that statement, I will build my church, which had occurred? Had, had John the Baptist died at that point or was he still alive? Had the church started? Well, the church hadn't started, but was John the Baptist alive? Well, again, you have to do a little investigative judgment and kind of go back a few chapters from where that's found, where uh, I will build, and find out that John the Baptist has been dead already, probably for more than a year. So what? He hadn't started the church, and John the Baptist is already off the scene. John is not connected, if you will, to the church. In fact, what is John called by Jesus? The greatest... Old Testament prophet, right? Remember? Yeah? So he's Old Testament. He's not New Testament. There's no succession of John in the Baptist baptisms, Acts 19. The idea that uh, you have to be baptized, but somebody has to be baptized, no. But if you're saved, good works comes in because you're saved. And you ought to be baptized. It's one of the first commandments, practically, that should take effect. The idea that I want to identify with Jesus Christ. By the way, baptism in the sense of the New Testament, when you go and read what was going on, you begin to get what history tells us. And even today, if you know a Jewish family, if a Jew got baptized... They had a funeral service for him back at the house. He was no longer part of the family. Nobody would speak to him. He no longer could stay in the house. He no longer was associated with any relative. So when a person got baptized, he knew this was going to be a really big, big statement to the world. And it was going to make a big difference in how he lived and where he lived because he may lose his job. He surely is going to lose his family and it's going to cost him. And you almost have to ask yourself the question, would Christians, new Christians today, be willing to do that kind of a step if that's what it was going to cost? Would I really want to identify with Christ that much? I don't want to get there yet, do I? Okay, I think I'm done. Any questions on that? That might be new for you, the idea of a Baptist brighter. I was on deputation, and I remember the first time I heard that, and I'm like, what kind of a Baptist church have I walked into? 
And then I found more and more of them. And they do have the terminology. They have a Bible college and a mission board and whatever. So, yes, it's around. But if you haven't heard about it, well, listen, I can remember when I never heard about it. <laughs> and some of the things I do in this class, I think you're getting the idea. I can remember I didn't know what this was. So we're all learning it together, maybe. I finally learned it. I can teach it. But uh, I'm glad that God has put me in those situations where I'm kind of challenged, if you will. All right. By and with the Holy Spirit. Third kind of baptism. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Matthew 3, verse 11. I indeed, John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay? With the Holy Ghost. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Interesting statement. Um, all of the verses I give, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there, it's with the Holy Ghost, okay? Don't get tied up too bad in it. But the idea, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have been told by the charismatics that if I don't speak in tongues, I've not been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I say, excuse me, I got baptized by the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Now we're going to get to that. I've also been told by a fellow who said, you have done well, you've repented, you've been baptized, you're even preaching the gospel. I met him on the mission field. He says, but you have not spoken in tongues, so you're not saved yet. I thought that was interesting. No, no. All right? But Acts 1.8, if you... Oh, I remember what I was supposed to do. Okay. Kind of as a sideline of when did the church begin? Not a sideline, really. In the book of Leviticus chapter 23 are the list of the feast days of the Jew. Okay? The first one is the Passover. Remember the Passover? It's the one where you kill the lamb and you put the blood on the doorpost. Okay? And that particular feast day represented what? In the future, sometime, the Passover lamb would die. And it's the blood that would be seen by God and he would pass over judgment on us. The next feast day is unleavened bread. And sometimes, well, not sometimes, it always coincided day-wise with the Passover. What is leaven in the Bible? What? Sin. Very good. Sin. So unleaven is to take away sin. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to say during this time of the, the, the Passover... Christ is taking away our sin. Okay? Good. By the way, unleavened bread, a good Jew would go to his door for the seven days and announce to the community in a loud voice, there is no leaven in my house, there is no leaven in my house, there is no leaven in my house. He'd do that seven times. No leaven, unleavened bread. Which then tells me when it comes time for the Lord's Supper, since it was the Passover that they were there for, as well as then the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, it can't be wine. There is no leaven. There is no fermentation. It's grape juice. Okay? So at any rate, there you are. Uh, unleavened bread to, to do away uh, with sin. The third one in Leviticus 23 is the first fruits. 
Remember what that one's about? You, they took the first crops that were out, wave it before the Lord. It was to show something. At some time in the future, Christ would be the first fruits from the dead. And he would be resurrected. The next one is one that gets kind of fuzzy. It's very specific. That is count 50 days after that resurrection. The day after the Sabbath, so it's not on the Sabbath day. What day is that feast day called? Fifty days. We actually have another term for it in the New Testament. What? Very good. Penta is five or fifty. And Pentecost is the fifty days. So what's happening on the day of Pentecost? It was coming whether the disciples met at Jerusalem and stayed there or not. It was a holiday or whatever you want to call it for 1,500 years. They had all of these others. Now, 50 days later, here's the Feast of Pentecost. What was it looking forward to? We have the others. They're all looking forward to something. And the other ones, we haven't even got to looking forward to something. But what's Pentecost? I believe the start of the church. Because on that day, in Acts chapter 2, uh, and we get there, uh, it's the idea of what the Holy Spirit did. They went out and preached. 3,000 souls were saved, and it says were added to the church. So at that point, guess what? The church is in progress. It started somehow, 120 in the morning, 3,120 in the evening. I wish we had had some revivals like that again. That would be good. All right. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Part of the Great Commission. The idea that the Jew would reach out literally to the world and because of the power of the Holy Spirit. All right. And then chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were all with one accord, one accord at, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, one of the rules of interpretation is first time it's mentioned. So here, being filled with the Holy Spirit is the idea of speaking in tongues. Well, maybe. First of all, let's get it straight. The word tongues here actually means languages. All right? And uh, some of the charismatics want to tell me I got to speak in tongues. I just look at them. I say, Bwake on a chakwe la, erali ta juan wat nejim, bwe wat chakra wat e, a jab jako a morindreo. That's John 3.16 in the Marshallese language. And I said, yeah, I could speak in tongues. And they're like, you know. I said, this stuff that they have recorded, this jibber jabbers that's quote in the charismatic movement, uh, no linguist has ever been able to decipher. It's not a language. Also, I heard something when I was at Bible college. I have spent my lifetime, whenever I see an encyclopedia, to look it up. And I know of seven at one point that I'd kept track of, every one of them. Trace the start of the Pentecostal movement. Guess when? 1903, because a couple of ladies started speaking in this jibber jabberish in some kind of Bible college somewhere out in the Midwest. It spread to somewhere in California, and they have a history of that's where it's at. But wait a minute. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and what? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So whatever Jesus was going to start wasn't going to stop. And speaking in tongues was dead by 100 A.D., according to history. 
And we're talking, you're looking it up in an encyclopedia, 1903, it started up again. Wait a minute. Ah. Oh, by the way, what is speaking in tongues a sign of? And this is a whole different subject. Ah. Coming judgment. God says in Deuteronomy, you turn from me, I'll do this. Turn from me, I'll do this. Turn from me, I'll do this. One of the latter things is I'll withhold rain. The other one is I can burn your crops down. Uh-huh. Well, does that sound like something God might do? Better be listening to him. But if you keep turning from me, he said, I will talk to you with another tongue, with a language you've not understood because you're going to be carried into captivity. That's in Deuteronomy. It's also found in the book of Isaiah. It's also found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And it's a quote from the Old Testament to say the idea that there are people now who suddenly can speak a tongue they've never studied and never been around at all is a sign that judgment is coming. And it was, and it did to the Jews. A.D. 70, they were taken out of their country. So the sign of, speak, of speaking in tongues was a sign. So in 1903, it's a sign they're going to be what? Taken out of their country? That's what it was before. It's exactly what God said it was. 1903, guess what? The Jews were not in their country, not till 1948. So again, that's, that's a different subject. I'm, excuse me for the rabbit trail, but you might find it interesting in today's world where you have so many powerful and influential people in the charismatic group why would I want to listen to them? Why? Is it they from God? They don't speak in a language. That's what it is in Acts 2. It's a language that's known. These people understood exactly what they're saying. In fact, they're saying it, why do we hear it not in just our language? The way it's said is our home language. You speak English. Down in St. Vincent, we speak English. I don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Did you catch? I'm, I'm speaking English to you. Me no no. Me don't know. I don't know. That's English. I had a guy in my church. I couldn't talk to him without a translator. And he spoke in English. I finally got where I could understand him after a fair, several months. And I said, wait a minute. I understood what you just said. But what did it mean? Give Jack his jacket. He said, oh, you Americans. I said, it's an idiom. It means give credit where credit is due. I said, okay. But we speak our English dialect. You're Southern, Yankee. Yeah, we got different. And in the day of Pentecost, they spoke the language of person that's listening, his town language, if you will, whatever language it was. Surprising. We know this guy's never been there. How can he do that? All right? The day of Pentecost is a very unusual day. And uh, I think it was the start of the church. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 1. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And he's going to begin to write about spiritual gifts. Mm, what's he saying? Uh, some of you don't know, but I don't want you ignorant. I want you to know this. I want you to learn this. And so here we are today, a new Christian. Now there's things here you need to know. All right? He's going to talk about spiritual gifts, and I'm going to skip verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And verse 25 I have, actually that's the wrong one. Verse 27, now they're in the body of Christ and members in particular. 
should be verse 27, not 25. All right? What's he saying? The Holy Spirit, when you got saved, when I got saved, placed us into, that's what the word means, baptism, into the body of Christ. So if you're saved, guess what? You've got the Holy Spirit. You may not totally recognize, you may not totally understand, but it's there. When I got saved, I could not defend the doctrine of the Trinity. I couldn't tell you all of these different terms of justification and sanctification. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed to repent, and I knew Jesus could save me, and that's all I needed to know to get saved. Now, since then, God, like, opened my eyes. By the way, you know you got baptized by the Holy Spirit. When you got, no, I didn't know that. And you know that he gave you a certain gift. No, I didn't know that either. I thought everybody could come up here and teach. I've met people that can't teach because they get up here, they shake so bad, their knees are knocking together and they can't hold their notes still. I've actually seen that happen. And do many people get embarrassed or, well, it's a gift to teach. But it's also a gift. I used to coach basketball. And I just told my team, I said, look, I said, I'm going to guarantee you mercy is not one of the gifts that God gave me. And if this women's team decides they want to play us, we are not showing mercy. Well, we beat them 130 to about 30. No mer the Women would not even talk to me after the game. I just, well, what can I say, you know? But everybody has got some gift that God has given them. I had a pastor that I met that was my pastor and for years. I had to learn mercy from him. I didn't have it. <laughs> he was an amazing fellow. All right? But here Paul says, I want you to know these things. I don't have you ignorant. You were baptized into the body of Christ, placed into. The word by and with, by the way, same word in the Greek. There's not a difference there. It's the same Holy Spirit putting us into the body of Christ when we got saved. It's something that was automatic. It was done whether we knew about it or not. Baptized with fire. And this is where we're going to finish. All right. Acts 2. And again, 1 to 4. No, oh, I got another verse, sorry. On the day of Pentecost... They, people say, we observe Pentecost just like they did back there, the speaking in tongues. Excuse me. That's not all it said. Where's the tongues of fire that come and sit on somebody's head? They don't have it that today. Nobody does. So this is a one-time experience, I do believe. It's not something that's a repetitive type thing. Tongues of fire came and sat on them. So... Perhaps when he talks about, we've read the scripture passages, he will baptize you with fire. Might be talking to the people he was talking about, who he's going to baptize, and this is what happened on the day of Pentecost. All right? 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. God tells us in advance, you and I will pe be put through the test too. And do not be surprised. And sometimes you may think, I'm the only one who's ever experienced this. The answer is, no, you're not. No, you're not. Somebody else prior to you has gone through the exact same thing. And if you want some comfort and consolation, look in the Word of God. Because people have gone through just what you and I have gone through. So again, the idea of a fiery trial, I don't know about you, but this pandemic thing, all of these rules and regulations, almost <sighs> depressing, almost overwhelming. And then add to that, what do you do with some families who have somebody who dies? How do you have a funeral? Somebody who has a wedding, how do you get together for that? It's just all of these different things. And then. Think about the people. A half a million people evacuated with the fires out in, in Oregon. 
And, uh, you know, we're just living in some amazing times. But guess what? In the past, somebody's gone through the same thought process you and I have gone through. And I can tell you, if you sit and listen to the news and let it depress you or let it get you fearful, you're looking at the wrong thing. You need to look at the Bible and get encouragement from God because this is the time to talk to people about what are you going to do if you get the virus? Are you ready to go to eternity? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? This is the time to tell people, yeah, we need to look to God because there is no other hope. He's bringing these judgments on us in particular, I believe, to get our attention. By the way, if you know anything about Black Lives Movement, they're Marxists. And with that, they hate God, period. You know anything about Marxism? And by the way, the Marxists before them, what, Stalin killed 27 million people. We better think about something like that because that's what these people are going to do, what these people are going to do. You're in the way, you have the wrong thought. We're not just going to cancel you and get you fired from your job. We'll put you to death if we have to. And I read where a professor said man was justified to pull out a gun and kill an anti-protester. Well, I thought that's interesting. You ought to fire him. All right, Hebrews 6, 1 to 3, basic Bible doctrines. I'm not going to cover all of them. All I wanted to make sure was on baptism. So next week, we'll pick up on uh, the rest of chapter 6 and go from there. Okay, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the Word of God. Lord, it is a lot deeper and wider than we'll ever conceive. Lord, our mind just cannot wrap around it. But Lord, help us to be...